الدكتور انوش جبتا هو دكتور في جامعه اللي هي مسمى الانترناشونال سيتي يونيفرسيتي في بريطانيا خريج طبعا بكالوريوس ماجستير ودكتوراه من امريكا هو الان في سنه تفرغ علمي موجود في بيرزيت كويس اجى يعني يعطينا محاضره عن اللي هو التطور الاقتصادي والسياسات الصناعيه. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for for coming. Can you hear me? هو هو بيشكركم طبعا على الاستدعاء وعلى الدعوه. So um, I'm just going to my background is in political economy and I work on the political economy of financial systems and I've been teaching this semester in Birzeit University uh, a course on development um, development economics generally. طبعا هو خلفيته بقول انه هو بالبوليتيكال ايكونومي اللي هو السياسات الاقتصاديه والان هو في بيرزيت بدرس اللي هو التطور او الاقتصاد. I'm my my expertise is not Palestine. I'm still studying Palestine. I'm still trying to learn. I'm still wanting to understand the situation. So you have to excuse me. This are very preliminary. That's why I've just said notes on development. These are very just first thoughts first impressions after spending two or three months here talking to some bankers talking to some people in the PMA these are just initial thoughts so please excuse me for that طبعا هو بقول ان انا لا زلت اتعلم عن الاقتصاد الفلسطيني ولهذا السبب هو يعني من ضمن الشكول هي اضاءات عن الاقتصاد الفلسطيني وقابل شخصيات في البنوك وشخصيات في اللي هي السلطه الوطنيه الفلسطينيه حتى ايش يطلع في صوره كامله عن اللي هي الوضع في فلسطين So the main thing that has struck me in talking to people here, talking to people in uh, industry, talking to people in uh, the government, and reading a lot about the development uh, uh, ideas here, is that there seems to be one problem. There are many problems you have, of course. You're under colonialism, you're under occupation, you have settlers. These are this is a big problem. But there's another problem here, and the problem is that there's no growth vision. There's, there's only there's the the vision of the economy. How should the economy grow? This I feel is somewhat lacking. بالنسبة للمادة الموجودة عنده هي هو بدو يتكلم عن اللي هو الاقتصاد والمشاكل اللي إحنا بنواجهها وخصوصا إنه إحنا لازلنا تحت تحت الاحتلال والموجود إنه لحد الآن ما في عنا اللي هو نظرة مستقبلية لعملية التطوير. So it seems that there is a what I'm calling a pass through economy. You take in some taxes, but you take in a lot of donors, donations from from the international community. Then you take in a lot of imports. You take the money from outside, then you send it abroad for imports. So there's no production happening in Palestine. It's just consumption, right? You take money from the outside, and then you pass that money on to importers. So it's a pass-through economy. And the problem is that this is just one problem. This is a structural problem. But then there's a mindset problem. Right, and that's what I'm going to talk about. There's a neo, what I'm calling a neoliberal mindset, not just I'm calling. There's, this is the prevailing vision in the country as to how to grow, and I'm going to suggest a solution to replace this neoliberal mindset, and that is called industrial policy. Of course, you need freedom as well. You need your own country. You need your own independence. But along with that, when you get your independence, what are you going to do with it? What's the idea that is going to drive economic growth? And I want to suggest that. Even when you get uh, freedom, uh, the neoliberal mindset might be replaced with an industrial policy mindset. طبعا هو بحكي بحكي بالنسبة للمساعدات الخارجية بقول إنه المساعدات الخارجية اللي بن إحنا إحنا قاعدين بنأخذها ما هو إلا عبارة عن مرور من عنا يعني بتيجي عنا وإحنا بندفعها لمين لعملية إنه بنستورد وندفعهم لازم لازم إنه هذه الفلوس اللي بنأخذها المساعدة يجب أن أن تستثمر داخل 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 البلد. حتى احنا نحصل ايش على اللي هو تطور للاقتصاد اللي موجود عندنا لهذا السبب هو في عنده ايش بده يحط ايده على المشاكل حتى يوجد الحلول لهذه المشاكل وعمليه التطوير والاستثمار للمواد للموارد والمساعدات الخارجيه اللي احنا بنحصل عليها so the first question is what is the growth vision what do i mean by a growth vision what is the definition of a growth vision very simply it's what is the plan to get rich Okay. How does a country go from a poor country to a middle-income country to a rich country? How does this happen? What is the vision? What is the prevailing idea in any given society as how do you go from being poor to being rich? And and the current plan is neoliberalism. And what do I mean by neoliberalism? What I mean by neoliberalism is the following: the idea is you simply build institutions. 
Yeah, this is the this is the ideology of the government under the World Bank, under the Washington Consensus, under Salam Fayyad, and so on and so forth. This idea that what you have to do is build institutions, you get good governance, and then you get growth. So growth, economic growth, the, the vision is first build institutions, first get good governance, and then you will get growth. Plus or minus freedom. Independence is a secondary issue. Maybe you'll, that will come, that will not come. But the main issue is you have to have in these strong institutions of good governance, and then... Uh, دولة من الدول الفقيرة أو دول اللي تتطلب مساعدات حتى أنت تصبح دولة إيش تنتقل من الفقر إلى إلى الغنى مثل ما صار في عنا دول كثيرة كانت من الدول المتأخرة يقول يجب أول حاجة أن تبني أنت مؤسسات والمؤسسات ليست المؤسسات الخدمية وبناء ما كان يقوم عليه إنه هو بناء دولة مؤسسات لا هو يجب أن نبني بناء دولة مؤسسات بالإضافة إلى لمساعدة الاقتصاد مثل إيش المؤسسات إنتاجية ومشابة ذلك حتى إيش حتى يكون عنا اللي هو مؤسسة سبول إنستيتيشن أند جود جوز برضو إضافة إلى ذلك اللي هو الحكومة الرشيدة أن يكون هناك حكومة تستطيع أن تنفذ ما ما قامت بالتخطيط عليه حتى نصل إلى إلى الحرية وإلى عملية التطور الاقتصادي. So what is good governance? Rule of law, um, all these institutions like property rights. You get all of these clear first. And then you get growth. This is the vision that's currently dominating here, and that's a vision that comes from the World Bank, from the IMF, and so on and so forth. The problem is, as I say, is that there's no evidence. There's no evidence in the world that this vision actually works. And I'll show you very quickly one graph of this. Okay, this is a this is a graph of growth. There's growth on this axis, and there's scores of good governance on this axis. Okay, so the better you are governed. Is shown on here, and the higher growth is is over here. Now there are three groups of countries here. Okay, there's low growth and low governance countries in the red. Okay, there's high growth and high governance countries in the blue, and then there's this group of countries in the green, which are bad on governance because they're this side, right? They have low governance scores, but they have high growth. This group of countries in the green over here. Okay, now if the governance story was correct. Countries should go from here to here. They should go this way because the more you increase on governance, the more you should grow. Um, so, so this is this this group of countries shouldn't exist. But the fact remains that the order happens first. You get growth first. You get rich, then you get good governance. So if you go here and then you go across, you don't go like this. So there's no actual evidence. طبعا يجب يجب ان يؤدي الى الى تطور تطور اقتصادي طبعا مقسم العالم الى ثلاثة اقسام او الحكومات مقسم الى ثلاثة اقسام حكومه سيئه واقتصاد سيء اللي هو باللون الاحمر وحكومه سيئه واقتصاد مرتفع زي بعض الدول الموجوده عندنا اللي هو اللون الاخضر وحكومه جيده واقتصاد جيد له باللون الأزرق طبعا بقول انه يجب اذا كانت هناك الحكم الرشيد والحكم الجيد يجب الاقتصاد الاقتصاد ان يتطور وان يرتفع حتى يصل الى اللون اللون الازرق لانه هو باقصى اليمين يمين مرتفع اذا كان في اليسار ومرتفع فهو حكومي غير جيد ولكن اقتصاد زي ما بصير اللي هو في دول البترو دولار الموجود عندنا so these are this 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 data is taken from mushtaq khan and the world this is based on the world bank's own data based on the world bank's own data they themselves are showing that the countries who are growing are not well governed. And yet what they say is no, first you get good governance and then you get growth. And I'm saying I want to challenge this vision. بقول هذا ما اخذه من طبعا من دراسات في البنك الدولي اسم الدكتور اللي عمل هاي الدراسه اللي هو مشتاق خان بقول انه يجب يجب على الاثبات انه اذا كانت هناك حكومه جيده يجب ان يكون هناك تطور جيد ومرتفع. So I'm putting this to one side. Then we have to ask the question. Once we put this to question to one side, you've seen the evidence there. So then is the question, how did rich countries get rich? What was their growth vision when they became rich? What did they do? And if you look at all historical cases, going back to France, Germany, America, Japan, Korea, all the countries who have developed, they all had one thing in common. They did something called industrial policy. كيف 
تصبح دولة دولة غنية وما هي الرؤية يجب أن يكون هناك هي رؤية لعملية التطور عملية اللي هي الجروث الموجود ومثال على ذلك اللي هي فرنسا ألمانيا بريطانيا أمريكا واليابان اللي اليابان طبعا وكوريا الشمال الجنوبية من فترة بسيطة من من الحرب العالمية الثانية لحد الآن شو الاقتصاد اللي أصبح عنده مطور طبعا ليش لأنهم كلهم مشتركين بحاجة واحدة اللي هو السياسة الصناعية متفقين عليه. What is the what is industrial parks? What exactly is it? It's I'm defining as a concerted effort by a set of institutions, not necessarily the government, but it's going to involve the government centrally to promote high value added economic activities. Okay? This is what industrial policy is. You take a set of value added activities and you focus on them and you make sure that that grows. It's 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 to organize your your policy to generate to move up the value chain, okay? And then we'll, I'll break this down and, and how this happens, but basically it's a concerted effort by a set of institutions, including but not only the government, to focus on high value added activity. <laughs> مع بعض حتى يصلوا ايش الى الى اعلى درجه واعطاء اللي هي فاليو اعلى للاقتصاد من حيث ايش عمليه عمليه التحريك وعمليه ايش اللي هي التفعيل لهذا الاقتصاد ار يو فوكسينج ان فاليو ادد رادر ذان فوكسينج اون ذا اندستريال اتشن لايك يو ار فوكسينج ان فاليو ادد يس to grow this economy as in whole. Yeah. So now the remaining of my uh, uh, lecture is going to be in four parts. Hopefully I'll have time to cover all of the four parts, but I'm going to break it down into four parts for the rest of the lecture, okay? First part, why do we need industrial policy, okay? Apart from the fact that everyone in history has grown by industrial policy, I want to break down some theory. Why is it, what is the theory behind industrial policy? The second question, of course, is important for Palestinians. Can you have industrial policy when you're colonized? Right? This is the most important thing. You're under a colonial occupation here. Can you have industrial policy during occupation? Can you have industrial policy, thirdly, in a, in a global system which is unequal, which has concentrated power in some places and unequal power in other places? And lastly, what kind of politics do you need in Palestine? What kind of questions do you need in Palestine to get the uh, industrial policy going here? So these are the four points I'm going to cover for the rest of the lecture. Hopefully, I'll get through all of them. <laughs> أسئلة. السؤال الأول بقول ما هي الاحتياج ما هي السياسة الصناعية التي تحتاجها حتى نطور إيش نطور البلد ثانيا هل نستطيع أن أن نضع سياسة سياسة صناعية تحت الاحتلال تحت الاحتلال وثالثا بقول لانه انه عدم عدم التساوي في اللي هو عمل عمليه اللي هي التقسيم العالمي او او الكون الجلوبال ورابع رابعا شو شو السياسي السياسي التي نحتاجها السياسه المحليه محتاجها من اجل السياسه الاقتصاديه. Do you need industrial policy? This is based on a very simple premise. You don't grow through comparative advantage. No one ever grew through comparative advantage. This is an, an anti-comparative advantage vision. If comparative advantage was correct, then Japan should be selling silk and rice. This is Japan's comparative advantage in the 1800s and the, and the 1900s. This is Japan's comparative advantage. But Japan said, no, I don't want to sell silk and rice. I want to sell high value added products, right? J uh, when Britain developed, it didn't want to just stick to wool. It moved from wool to cotton to industries and so on and so forth. It moved up the value chain. When Germany developed, it, it went from electronics to chemicals to heavy engineering, right? Same with America. There's no country has ever developed through comparative advantage, okay? Because comparative advantage has a lot of problems with it. I won't get into the full critique of comparative advantage. But just to say simply that there is no comparative. So in other words, for Palestine, you're not going to get rich by, by, by real estate and olives. It's not going to happen, okay? You're going to stay poor if you just stick to olives. So that's the first thing that is that growth only happens when you go to high value added services.
عن 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 فاركس. هنا انت بدك بدك تتطور وبالاقتصاد يرتفع عندك، يجب ان تركز مش على الشيء الموجود عندك، لو لو احنا بدنا نركز ان كان اليابان لحد الان بعدها بتبيع اللي هو رز وسمك والمانيا بعدها مركزه على نوعيه الصناعه، بريطانيا بعدها على الصوف وعلى الفحم، لكن لكن انت يجب ان تتطور وبتركز على اللي هي السلع ذات اللي ايش السعر العالي والقيمه العاليه الموجوده عندنا مثل ما صار في اليابان، اليابان كانت شو كانت وصارت بتبيع الكترونيات، المانيا كانت تركز مثلا في الالكترونيات واصبحت هلا في اللي هي الصناعات الثقيله، بريطانيا كذلك، لهذا السبب من المهم جدا انه دائما يعني نخلي النظره دائما تكون ايش؟ اعلى ما تكون ايش اقل من المطلوب. So if that's the premise, if that's the, uh, the idea that growth happens through value-added services, then the question becomes, how do we get them, right? How do you, how do you produce high value-added services? This is very difficult, and not just services, but goods and services, all products. It's very difficult. Why? Because there's a problem of learning. How do you learn? I can't immediately go and build a cell phone. I need to learn. I need to be in a context where I need to learn, right? It's think about learning a language. I'm currently I'm speaking Arab. I'm learning to speak Arabic, but I need time to learn. Immediately, if I have to come here and I have to lecture you in Arabic, I can't do it, right? I have to, I need time to learn, and then only I have to be exposed to to to, uh, uh, to, to speaking in public, right? So that's the rationale behind infant industry protection, right? You have you have to protect industry, give it time to grow, give it time to get strong. Give it time to produce at world markets, at world prices, at world quality, and then when it's strong enough, you take the protection away. Okay? So if you if you expose an industry before it's ready to produce, you'll destroy it. You will destroy that industry. You look at you look at footwear in Hebron. You had lots of uh, uh, shoe industries in Hebron, and then you exposed it too soon to Chinese competition. Now, from hundreds of foot manufacturers in Hebron, you have five. <laughs> تكون عندك صناعة وسياسة صناعية جيدة يجب أن تحمي صناعاتك الموجودة اللي هي بقول اللي هي الإنفنت معناها اللي هو الطفل الرضيع أو إيش في حالة الرضاعة أول حاجة مهم جدا إن التعلم أنت يجب أن تتعلم شو كيف تعمل ومن ثم بتعمل صناعتك بتعملها حماية كاملة طبعا الحماية كيف تكون حماية الصناعات اللي هي بفرض الضرائب على المستورد بتكون حتى تكون اغلى ومن ثم حتى لما تكون انت منافس للسوق العالمي ونوعيته بتقدر انه ترفع الحمايه عنها وضرب مثل ما كان مثل ما كان في الخليل كان عندنا في الخليل طبعا مئات المصانع اللي بتعمل اللي هي الاحذيه واحنا بنعرف انه حتى حتى الاحذيه في الخليل هي احذيه يعني منافسه للسوق العالمي للاسباني وللهذا ولكن لما رفعوا الحمايه عنها للاسف الشديد وجدوا ايش؟ وجدوا انه سكرت لحد الان بس بالوقت الحالي ما فيش الا خمس مصانع اللي شغاله في في الخليج من مصانع الاحذيه. That's the second rationale for industrial policy. You need infant industry protection. The third one is that there's market failures in technology transfer. Right? If you have to move up the value chain, you need technology to come to you. Okay? But technology only comes to you in small, little, continuous bits. The market, as a, as a mechanism for organizing production, the market is very good at continuous, small changes. But because developing countries are so backward, we're so behind, I'm from India, India is also very much behind, even further behind Palestine, okay? We need, the, the gap is very large. So we need a discontinuous change. We need something that will make us jump, not a continuous change. The market is very good at doing continuous changes, not very good at doing discontinuous changes. So you need some institution. You need some institution to make up for this market failure in transferring technology in a discontinuous fashion. طبعا بحكي اللي هو اهم حاجه في الصناعه طبعا اللي هي التكنولوجيا والمشكله اللي بنواجهها احنا في دول العالم الثالث وضرب مثل مثلا حتى حتى في الهند وفي فلسطين وفي الدول الناميه انه عمليه التكنولوجيا انتقال التكنولوجيا من الدول المتطوره الى الدول الاقل اقل حظا هي بشغلات ايش؟ بحاجات بسيطه ولكن الصناعه اذا انت بدك تستمر في صناعتك وتكون منافس يجب ان التكنولوجيا تكون ايش؟ اللي هي مثل ما بقولوا اللي هو يكون مفتوح لعملية نقل التكنولوجيا من من اللي هو الدول المتطورة الدول الأقل نمو نموا والهند كانت مثال على ذلك. The frequent criticism of industrial policy is that isn't this picking winners? The idea is that the government can pick the 
the, the most efficient uh, 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 industry or the most efficient firm within an industry. And of course, the question is, how does the government know? How does the government have the information that you are more efficient than you are? This firm A is more efficient than firm B. How, why, can, why are you picking winners? And of course, there's all the criticisms of corruption and so on and so forth that come with that. We'll come to that in a second. But I want to say that no, this is not picking winners for three reasons. What, is it, what it is about is about creating institutions for learning, stimulus and response, and backwards forward limited. I'll come to you. Hal hiya al hukumat akum bi intika al sanaa al najiha? Tabaan min min wujhat al nazar bukul la. Hey, lano ida kana tadi al jismo kya bida akum al hukum bi intika hadi al sanaa? Tabaan hai dakhal ish al wasta al dakhal al al rashawi wa al 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 bhasubiya fi intika. Hey, lano ma fi anda kriteria aw ma fi anda haji al hukum bi akum ish hamlet hazi al mizan. طبعا اهم حاجه فيها حتى انت بتقوم على عمليه انتقاء يجب انه انه اللي هو وجود او انشاء اللي هو معاهد التعلم الموجوده عندنا طبعا في عندنا اللي هو عمليه عمليه التعلم وعمليه اللي هو التغذيه التغذيه الراجعه وبعدين اللي هو في عندنا اللي هو الرابط اللي هو اذا السير الى الامام او الخلف حتى نقيس انه مدى نجاح هذه المؤسسه اذا كانت مترابطه ام غير مترابطه. So why what, what do I mean by learning? If value addition is the problem, okay? If value addition is where we have to focus our efforts, then we have to we need knowledge on how to move up the value chain. How do you produce a certain thing? How do you lay out a factory? How do you control quality in a product? All of this requires knowledge, and all of that requires learning. So you need to set up a certain set of institutions to maximize learning. It's not picking the industry. It's setting up a process whereby knowledge can be acquired. And that's why technical universities like, uh, like Palestine Technical University are very, very important as an institution for learning. Second, you need uh, a system which will, you don't pick this industry to succeed. You generate it so that it'll be it'll it'll develop in a series of steps. You stimulate and then you get some response, and then from that response you build a further step and a further step and a further step. There's a feedback mechanism that you have to generate to go upwards in the value chain, and that's what this is about. Not about picking a final product, but picking a product that will then lead to a further product that will then lead to a further product, right? And that's the third part: backwards and forwards linkages. What does this mean? You have to pick a certain set of industry or a certain set of activities whose, which will generate other businesses, right? If, and they, there will be maximum spillover effects in these businesses. If I want to build a university, I need construction, I need students, I need faculty. Those students need to be trained. Those students need to be housed, etc., etc. So you go back in the supply chain and you can, you can maximize spillover effects by picking certain industries that can, that can, that can do that. So, so it's about creating a context within which you can learn and you can maximize these linkages. طبعا طبعا اللي جاب على هذا السؤال بقول إنه بناء بناء المؤسسات التعليمية من أجل إيش من أجل التعلم ومثال مثال على ذلك اللي هو الجامعة أنا لما بدي أبني جامعة بدي أبني بدي بدي يكون في في عندي طلاب بدي يكون عندي هي هي تدريسية بدي يكون عندي برضو كمان صناعة حتى أرسل الخريجين الموجودين عندي على اللي هو لعملية التدريب ومن ثم ومن ثم إنه هذول الثلاثة بيكونوا كلهن إيش كقطعة واحدة حيث إنه إنه الطلاب الخريجين الموجودين عندنا بيكونوا مربوطين مع المجتمع المحلي من أجل التدريب ومن أجل عملية التوطئ. So the so the big the big industry in the 19th century when German and uh, Germany and the U.S. were expanding was railways, right? The railroads. Why why were railroads important? Because for railroads you need steel, and for steel you need coal, and for coal you need you know, So you go back and back in the supply chain. So one industry generated about five or six other industries, and like that you can multi have a kind of multiplier effect. بقول إنه أنا لما بدي أعمل أي صناعة أو أي حاجة مهم جدا أول حاجة اللي هي إيش الطرق اللي هي إنشاء الطرق إنشاء الطرق شو بيأدي بيأدي إلى إلى تطوير إيش المصانع الحديد مصانع الفحم وأي أي صناعات أخرى يعني 
اي صناعه تبدا اول شيء اللي هي اللي بيسموها اللي هي الانفراستراكشر او الاشي الاساسي اللي هو مثل الشوارع والكهرباء وما شابه ذلك، وضرب مثال انه الصناعات في امريكا وفي المانيا في القرن الثامن عشر والتاسع عشر، اول ما بلشوا بلشوا اللي هو في انشاء اللي هي البنيه التحتيه من اجل ايش؟ من اجل اللي هي انشاء الصناعات الاخرى. So the question is uh, another criticism of this can be isn't this just another formula why you're giving us another you've, you're discarding neoliberalism and you're putting that aside we are just giving us another formula you're just giving another uh, 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 recipe for for development so you know you're committing the same mistake that you're criticizing other people have committed and I'm saying no because context is critical this is not a one size fits all policy the context in a particular situation is very, 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 very important. So it's not, a, it's not a recipe that I can take to India and to Palestine and to China and to Malaysia and to Sub-Saharan Africa and it's the same will work everywhere. No, it depends on the context. And there are two very important moments of context that I'll talk about. But the main important thing is that this is how it's different from a formula. A formula is just a recipe. If I want to make uh, a particular dish, Give me the ingredients, I'll cook them, you get the dish. If it, this dish is the same in India or in Palestine, it's the same. This is not a formula, this is not a recipe. Okay? This is a method. التطور من من ايش؟ بتقول هو خط حرج يجب ايش؟ عمليه الوصول له بحيث انه ما يكونش عندنا هي وصفه خاصه ليه؟ لانه الوصفه الموجوده مثلا في الهند تختلف عن الوصفه اللي هي موجوده عندنا هي عمليه وضع خطوط معينه من اجل الوصول الى ايش؟ الى السياسي او الى المعادله اللي تكون هي الامثل لكل دوله مختلفه. So the two important, well one major important part of any context is politics. As a, there's a saying in English that all politics is local, right? All politics involves local context, right? So the, the political struggle in Palestine is different from the political struggle in Bombay, it's a different from the political struggle elsewhere. So, and you have a, 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 a political settlement is the balance of power. How a particular context the, how the power is arranged, how the power is settled in any particular place. And at any given moment, for any particular political settlement, there will be some parts of it which are, generate opportunities and some parts which are closed. This is different in different places. So the political settlement will generate a set of targets for you to push policy. Give, let me give you an example. You have a political settlement here that's governed by the Paris Protocol, which is part of Oslo, right? This is, a, this is the Paris Protocol which is part of the Oslo Agreement in 1992-93, is part of the balance of power between Israel and Palestine, yes? The balance of power created this document and that set a framework. Now, this, this framework has certain opportunities and certain costs. There are some opportunities within this framework where you can target and then say, go. this settlement is not the same in other countries, so you have to understand the local politics to understand where the opportunities are. هلا اذا اذا كنت بدك تشوف شو الموجود عندنا طبعا احنا خصوصا احنا في فلسطين مربوطين في حاجه اللي هي بنسميها اللي هي اتفاقيه باريس الاقتصاديه طبعا هي اتفاقيه باريس تختلف عن كل الاتفاقيات الموجوده على جميع انحاء العالم ليه لانه السياسي الموجود او المخطط لها تختلف عندهم لهذا السبب اذا كنت انت بدك تشوف شو الهدف او شو الوصل اللي انت بدك توصل له مهم من المهم جدا ان يكون هناك عمليه عمليه معرفه ماذا هناك في العمل في الاتفاقيه وشو اللي انت بتحتاجه وشو انت ما بتحتاجه حتى يكون ايش اللي هو اتفاقيه برضه كمان لانه في هناك اهداف يمكن الوصول اليها وفي اهداف لا يمكن الوصول اليها بتكون مغلقه بسبب الاتفاقيات مع الدول الاخرى الموجوده so it's not a formula and it's also agnostic on whether it's state or market led in this view the state and the market are just social institutions they are both can be designed by politics so it's not like it should be all government or all market or some combination in between. This also is governed by the context. Whatever works in a particular context, you can do that. Okay? So it's not about state is better than market or market is better than state. It's not a, it's not a, a vision that says, before I see a place, I know always that market is better. 
for instance, this is what the neoliberalism does, right? This says, no, what works in a particular, what combination of, of states and markets works in a particular context? بقول برضه كمان انه هو زي ايش؟ زي عملية ضياع وبقدرش الانسان يختار انه هل هي يجب ان يكون حكومي او يعني حكومي او ان يكون ايش اللي هو التجاري يعني استيت اللي هي الحكومة والماركت اللي هو عملية التجار بقول لا يجب ان يكون هناك عملية اللي هو تداخل انه ان يكون هو حكومي ويكون ايش؟ تجاري ليش؟ لانه بنقدرش احنا نفاضل بين وحدة عن الثانية يجب ان يكون التدخل الثنتين متداخلات مع بعض but in general, you can, we can identify a few features of industrial policy that has worked very well in particular contexts. And I'm going to talk about a few general features, a few general uh, uh, methods that have been used uh, to, to work in these particular contexts. The first one, the first rule, wherever industrial policy has worked, it's combined subsidies and discipline. Uh, في في حاجة مهمة جدا برضو إنه بالنسبة لعملية الصناعة أن يكون هناك عملية عملية الدعم دعم للمنتجات ويكون برضو كمان حتى مع إنه دعم يجب أن يكون هناك عملية اللي هو الانضباط عملية أن يكون هناك منضبط. What is what is the subsidy? A subsidy can take very different forms. A subsidy can can be a barrier to trade. It can be so you put a tariff. And you control uh, 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 you control the trade coming in. This is a subsidy to domestic producers. A subsidy can be a barrier to entry into a particular industry. So you only give out five licenses to produce uh, to produce cell phones. This right? You don't give out more licenses. This can be a barrier. To entry. A subsidy can be uh, financial help. I give you lo soft loans for 20 years, 30 years at very low interest. This is a subsidy, right? And why do you need a subsidy? Again, it's for infant industry protection. Okay, if the industry is small, they're not going to be able to compete. So you need to subsidize them for some time until they can compete. Okay, this is a, that's what a subsidy is. A subsidy can take many different forms depending on the particular context. But if if the subsidy is given without discipline, without control, then industrial policy has failed. This is the story of India. <laughs> شو بعد عملية الدعم؟ عملية الدعم مش فقط عملية الدعم المادي، عملية الدعم بتشمل اللي هو فرض ضرائب على اللي هو على الاستيراد رقم واحد، رقم اثنين اللي هو عملية عدم إعطاء تراخيص لإنشاء لإنشاء مصانع أو عملية استيراد أكثر من اللازم فرضا يعني إذا في عندنا عندنا صناعات احنا بنمنع أي استيراد أي حاجة وإذا كان المفروض علينا نستورد بدنا نرفع الضرائب هاي عملية من عملية الدعم، وثانيا إذا أنا بدي أدعم كل حاجة طيب في عندي عملية اللي هو اللي اللي عملية الديسبلين بقول انه يجب ان ان تكون ايش؟ ان تكون موثقة وتكون ايش جيد لانه في حالة انه هاي لم يكن لم لم تكن موفقة معناته احنا اصبحت عندنا السياسة الصناعية كلها خاطئة بقدرش ارفع الدعم وما بقدرش اعطي اللي هو فوائد مثلا قروض بدون فوائد او ايش باشياء مخفضة so if you give subsidies without controls, if you give subsidies without discipline, what do you do? It's like giving a child a lot of shelter, but then not disciplining the child. The child will become spoiled. The child won't be able to succeed, right? He's over-sheltered, he's over-protected. That's, 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 that's what happens to a child when you over-protect a child, right? Similarly with an industry, you can, if you give subsidies without discipline, you can end up just sheltering inefficiency. Right? In India, for many, many years, we had these controls, but then the industries in, behind the controls, they just got very inefficient. We had the same car produced since 1950, because there was no discipline. Discipline is very important, because what you're, what you're doing is that society is giving this industry something very valuable. You're giving it a subsidy. So society should get something back in return. They should be able to produce at a very high level and move up the value chain. If they don't produce, you take away the subsidy. That's the discipline. بقول إذا إحنا إحنا بدنا نقول عملية الدعم الموجودة وضرب مثال اللي هو بإنتاج السيارات اللي كان في الهند من سنة 1950 تقريبا ل 1991 كان نفس السيارة اللي هي كان عندهم سيارة 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 الإمبازادور نفس الشكل. لمدة 50 سنة تم تمتها، ولكن لما الحكومة 
الحكومه رفعت الدعم عنها، صار في عندنا منافسين وصار في عندنا في سيارات انتاج سيارات افضل، لهذا السبب تمت عمليه العرض، ومثال اخر قال اذا انا بدي الولد الصغير تم اعطيه فلوس وتم احميه، هذا الولد حي ليش؟ حيخرب وحينحرف، لهذا السبب من المهم برضه كمان ان انا لما بدي اعطيه عملية الحماية مهم جدا انه يكون عملية اللي هو الانضباط مهم جدا وشو انت بدك تعطي للمجتمع يعني شو بدك تضيف للمجتمع مش نفس ال مثل ما بقول نفس الطبخه نفس الطبخه بده تمو هذا لازم يكون ايش هناك في بدائل وفائده يستفيد منها المجتمع. So remember why do we give subsidies at all? If you don't subsidize you will face international competition and you'll be killed off. Right? If you try to produce cell phones here, if you try to produce some other high value added services here, if you compete, in the, you can't compete in the global market, as I, you can't, as I showed with the example from Hebron, so you need to subsidize. But you, once you subsidize, you also need control, otherwise you get... Uh, uh, so this is a system of rewards and punishments. It's a, it's a reciprocal control mechanism. There's reciprocity. I'm giving subsidies, but I'm getting something in return. Right? I'm giving a reward. And if, and if you don't do the job that you're given for, I'm taking the punishment. So this is the same thing that the market does. The market is also a system of rewards and punishment. Yes? If you produce something well in the market, you get profit. If you don't produce well in the market, the firm dies. Yes? But the market discipline is too harsh for developing countries. It's too strict. It's, 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 a, very, it's a very harsh parent. It's like it's, 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 it does violence to the economy. You need, you need something that is that is like a market that gives reciprocal controls, uh, rewards and punishments, but in a way that you can move up the value chain. قول إنه العملية اللي هي التبادل في عملية اللي هو إعطاء الدعم مهم جدا إنه إذا أنا بدي بدي أعطي أي دعم مقابلها لازم أخذ إيش يعني التبادلية تكون بينه وبين إيش بين اللي هو شو أنا بدي أخذ الفائدة الموجودة عندي. وهذا عملية التبادلية هي تكون بعملية اللي هي اللي هي الكنترول الكنترول على اللي هي السياسة وعملية الدعم الموجودة. So basically that so that reciprocity is very important. Rewards and punishments very important. And you need to you need money for this, but you need to be able to give subsidies. Where do you get the where do you get the funds from? Right? Where do you get the resources from? So you need a, a fiscal politics that is getting everyone on board, that everyone says, yes, I agree to give my tax money to this project. So you need a, a kind of politics that will allow people to say, yes, taxation, and then you, you through that taxation, that's going to fund the subsidies. You also need a certain kind of monetary politics. You need a banking system that will, that will and a lot of, in a lot of developing countries, often it's the central bank in alliance with the banking system where this control is happening, because finance is the most important resource. And in every one of the development cases that we've seen, banking plays a very, very central role. And, and development banking in particular, because the key resource is money, right? So, uh, and, and, and if I give you finance, then I have to be able to discipline you. So, on the one hand, you need a, a fiscal alliance that everyone's willing to fund this in the society, on the one hand. On the other hand, you need a banking system that is geared towards development. بقول انه اللي هي السياسه الماليه، طبعا السياسه الماليه مقسومه لجزئين، اللي هي السياسه النقديه والسياسه الماليه. طبعا مهم جدا اني انا بدي يكون في عندي كنترول عليها وعمليه ايش؟ مراقبه مراقبه بحيث انه البنك لما بده يعطيك بده يعطيك الكارد يجب ان يكون هناك مراقبه بحيث بحيث انه بده يوصل لشو المعلومات او شو الاشياء اللي انت بدك تعطيها. So the second question, can you have such a system under colonial policy? Can you have an industrial policy when you're colonized? When you're in a situation where you have Israel colonizing, right? And the answer is yes, some pieces of it you can have. Some pieces of it you can have, okay? First of all, you need the vision. <laughs> they can't brainwash you, okay? That's the most important thing that you need to develop is the vision of industrial policy. Okay? Because if you, if you re maintain a vision of just neoliberalism and good governance, you're not going to get rich. No one can stop you from forming a vision under colonialism. No one can stop ideas. Okay? So that's the first thing that you can get apart. The most important part of this that you can get is the, is the vision, is the idea. <laughs> 
يكون في عندك سياسي سياسي اقتصادي تحت الاحتلال يقول نعم تستطيع ليه لانه فيش حدا بيقدر ايش يسيطر على الافكار الموجوده او الرؤى اللي انت الموجوده عندك لهذا السبب من المهم جدا ان يكون هناك رؤيه وخطه لعمليه التطوير الصناعه الموجوده every 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 everything that's worth doing every change that is worth happening right it can happen you can break down this change into small steps and the, and you can start with a small step today and move So if there's a barrier, this is freedom. On this side is freedom. On this side is colonialism. You can break down the process in such a way that some parts of the process you can start, some small steps you can start before you're free, and continue once you have once you have freedom. And I want to talk about four very small efforts in this direction that I've seen when I've been here uh, over over this past three months. نقول انه السياسه اللي بدك تراعي او الرؤيه اللي بدك تعطيها، يعني لو فرضنا انه في في هناك هناك جدار، جدار يفصل بين ايش؟ الاحتلال وبين الحريه، انت لازم تبلش طبعا كان كان اللي هو خلال السلطه اول ما اجت عندنا كان حاولوا انه يقوموا باي مشاريع قبل عمليه قبل عمليه اللي هو رجوع اللي هو السلطه الى الاراضي بحيث انه لما ترجع يصير عندك في عندك حريه تكون تبلش او كان في عندك اساس لا لعملية التقدم وفي عنده ايش اربع إيه يعني شغلات بده يعرضها بالنسبه لي كيف العملية اللي هو الانتقال من من إيه او التطور الاقتصادي من من إيه الاحتلال الى عملية الحرية. The first thing I want to talk about is um, is getting a bureaucracy that can execute industrial policy. So in order to actually execute industrial policy, you need a very strong, very professional bureaucracy, right? It has to be the the people in a bureaucracy have to be all have to be hired on the basis of their merit, on the basis of their expertise. They have to be technocrats. They have to be engineers. They have to be managers. They have to be hired not because you know they know their uncle who's in the sultan or something like this. They have to be hired because they're technocrats. Okay? No country has developed without a strong technocracy, and in Palestine. You have one example of a strong technocracy, and this is the Palestinian Monetary Authority, the PMA. بقول إنه العملية من المشاكل اللي بيعانوها اللي هي عملية البيروقراطية بتعرف البيروقراطية اللي هي عملية إنه إيش هذا بن فلان وهذا بن أخو فلان هذا ما أعرف ما أعرف فلان بقول إذا أنت بدك تتطور بقول في عندك يجب أن تكون اللي هي التطور على مثل ما بنعرف اللي هي التكنوقراط أو اللي هو الناس المؤهلين أو الناس المتخصصين إنه وضع الرجل المناسب في المكان المناسب ومثال على ذلك اللي هو المثال عنا اللي هو How did you get a professional PMA? You had a PMA governor who was appointed in the mid 90s called George Abed. Yes, you might have heard of George Abed. George Abed. You went to. He was the first one to be the first one to be the first one. When he was appointed, he told Abu Mazen very clearly, "I will not take the job unless you give me full autonomy. I'm going to make a professional bureaucracy here. If if you give me autonomy, I'll take the job." Otherwise, I won't touch it. Eh, طبعاً أول لقاء كان لما كانوا تم إنشاء سلطة النقد طبعاً كان مقابلة بينه وبين أبو عم أبو عمار وقال له إيش أنا بدي الاستقلالية التامة اللي هو أن يكون إيش يكون عنده الحرية في عملية اللي هو وضع الخطة أو وضع السياسات اللي هو يرتئي. So he made a political arrangement and then he professionalized the the PMA. Okay, so this has happened in Palestine. This is a this is an example that's already happened. Okay, so if you want to see how it can happen, there's a live example there. The second example, I'll go very quickly now because we're running out of time. The second example is tariffs. The Paris Protocol allows you to raise tariffs, and how and that gives you a lever to control infant industries. You can't lower tariffs because the Israel controls that, but you can raise tariffs. So there's at least one lever of 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 uh, industrial policy. The third example is the banking system. The banking system's loan to deposit ratio in Palestine is 50%. Okay? That means half the half the deposits are still in the bank. This is a huge resource. We we're talking about monetary politics before. There's a huge resource there if you can extract the discipline to 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 do that in Palestine. And the fourth step, which is also part of the security app, uh, part of the uh, of the occupation is the security apparatus. The one industry where you have moved up the value chain because of a lot of investment Because of a lot of learning by doing, because of a lot of training from abroad, is security. Now you have a very efficient security force. This is good for any country 
now it's being used for ba for keeping you colonized. But that same security force can be used for law and order, which is a, uh, which is uh, required in any uh, uh, country, and a lot of countries don't have this. So in these four areas, you have examples where you you can elements of this are in place that you can build on in the future. النقطة الثانية اللي هي بالنسبة للتعرف اللي هي التعرف الجمركية بقول إنه إحنا حسب اتفاقية باريس نستطيع أن نرفع الضرائب ولا نستطيع أن نخفضها لتسوى مع إسرائيل طبعا عملية عملية رفع التعرف الجمركية تؤدي إلى حماية الصناعة الصناعات الموجودة عندنا النقطة الثالثة اللي هو النظام البنكي النظام البنكي الموجود عندنا للأسف الشديد إنه أكثر من خمسين في المية من الودائع الموجودة في البنوك لا زالت في البنوك ولا يتم عملية استثمارها أو إعادة إعطائها كقروض من أجل الصناعة ومن أجل عمليات التطوير ولا كان في تتذكروا قبل فترة كان في مشكلة إنه غال إنه عملية السكيورتي أو عملية اللي هذا اللي بطلبوها البنوك لإعطاء قروض اللي هي فقط لفئة معينة لهذا السبب قليل جدا منهم بيأخذ قروض ل عملية استثمارية النقطة الرابعة المهمة جدا برضو هي عملية الأمن يجب أن يكون هناك عنا أمن دائم من أجل الحفاظ على اللي هي الأموال العامة وعلى الصناعات الموجودة عنا مدافع الأمن معنا الاستثمار بيكون موجود عنا إذا ما كانش في عنا أمن ما في حد بيجي يستثمر أمواله عنا. This is not a vision of economic peace. There's an idea that comes from Israel and that is 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 important here that you know forget for formal peace, let's just do economic peace. This is not an idea of economic peace. Economic peace is the idea of good governance, is the idea of neoliberalism. That's the, the idea that I was criticizing at the beginning. That's the idea of economic peace. That forget uh, the occupation, we can still have Rawabi. Right? That's the idea of economic peace. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is, is doing what you can for developing a growth vision within when colonization is still there with a view to what will happen after colonization. Okay? It's not just about building institutions, it's about building industries. بقول انه العمل العمليه مش عمليه انه انا انا بدي ابني بالاستثمار في بسموها في الممتلكات، الاستثمار هو يكون يكون الاستثمار في الامن، الاستثمار في الصناعات، الاستثمار في الامن الموجود اللي بده يحمي هذه الصناعات وضرب مثال بقول هي ومع ذلك عندنا ايش؟ عندنا مدينه الروابي الموجوده في عندنا اكثر من مدينه يتم يتم بالوقت الحالي انشائها، هذه اذا لم يكن هناك عمليه حفاظا على الاستثمار وحفاظا على الامن ولن يكون هناك عندنا اي سياسات صناعيه او اقتصاديه. So I'll skip over this because we're running out of time, but this basically just talks about can you have it in an unequal global division of labor? You can, but I'll skip over that for now. Finally, what, what uh, the last point is what is the kind of politics that is required locally? Okay, three points here I want to make. One, all, all institutions you have in any society, in any organization, in any society is just frozen politics. It's just politics that has stopped. Okay, so politics has stopped at a certain place and this becomes an institution. If you want to undo this institution, you just have to raise the temperature of politics and then the institution will melt away. Okay? That's the first point about the kind of uh, the kind of uh, politics that you can have locally. طبعا طبعا بقول شو شو اللي بنحتاجه احنا محل مهم محليا انه اكبر مشكله بنحكي من هذا انه عمليه السياسه بتكون ايش بتكون مجمده ومثل ما صار صار عندنا بالفترات السابقه انه لما تتجمد السياسه السياسه الاقتصاديه او السياسه السياسه سياسه المؤسسات عندنا ما ما بنصير في عندنا عمليه عمليه تطور لهذا لهذا السبب من المهم جدا انه ما ما اوقفش عند نقطه معينه انما انه اتوسع ويكون يكون عندي ايش سياسات دائمه عمليه التطوير ويكون عندي البدائل الموجوده So any any set of institutions is just random it's there's no deep reason why you know any particular society is configured in a particular way there's a lot of contingency there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. So un given that there's a lot of uncertainty, it doesn't, the, the, the situation could, uh, to, could become anything tomorrow. Suddenly you had Mubarak and then you had the Arab Spring. Within a matter of a week, so the whole thing just broke down, right? So there's a lot of contingency. And when there's that kind of uncertainty, whenever there's uncertainty, there's hope, right? Because it could go bad or it could go right. Both ways it could go, but at least there's 50% that it could go right, okay? So the when, whenever there's, there's no preordained reason why you're colonized by the Israelis, there's no preordained reason why, because Arab culture is like this, you'll always be like this, or some reason like this. 
No one ordained anything. It's very risky. It's very contingent. And because it's contingent, you can have a hopeful open horizon. طبعاً بقول إنه بن بن بالنسبة ل اللي هو السياسات الموجودة عندنا طبعاً نعرف إنه هناك في سياسة اللي هو المخاطرة وعدم وعدم التأكد ومع ذلك يوجد عندنا هناك ما يعرف اللي هو دائماً في الأمل إذا لم يوجد هناك الأمل معناته إيش بصير في عندنا كثير من ال 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 اللغط ودائما احتمال إنه إيش أملك يكون إيش والتغيير يكون للأفضل إما للأسوأ وإذا ربنا مثلا في مصر خلال إنه خلال أسبوع كان إيش مباراة متغير وأجت ال 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 الحكومات ال الحكومة الثانية وهي الحكومة الثالثة اللي اللي حصل فيها. So contingency equals hope. Lastly, you have to think about varieties of the market economy. When everyone says no, no, we need a market, we need a market, we need a market, you have to ask them the question, what does this mean? There is no such thing as the market. There's only different kinds of markets. Okay, there's, and the market is like any institution. It has rules, it has politics, it's configured in a certain way. So you have to ask what kind of market. Industrial policy is also a kind of market. The slave market is also a kind of market. These are all different kinds of markets with different products and different things. You have to ask the question, what format, what variety of market economy is good for me? The German market is different from the Swedish market, is different from the American market. These are not the same things. Okay? So again, it depends on context. It's not one size fits all. You have to choose the kind of market economy that works for Palestine. Not, for, not the one that works in Austria. You can learn from Austria, but you have to choose a different kind of market economy for you. طبعا بالنسبة لا نقول إنه هناك اختلاف في اللي هي الأسواق طبعا إحنا بدنا سوق السوق يجب أن يكون إيش السوق مفصل إلنا إنه إحنا تحت سياستنا بيزبطش إني أخذ سياسة السوق الألماني أو الأسترالي وأطبقها اللي في عندي في سوقي ليه لأنه كل سوق يختلف إيش ما عن الآخر سوق مثلا سوق اللي هو الخدم أو سوق العبيد هو هو عبارة عن مارك السوق اللي الصناعات في ألمانيا أو في السويد أو في في إسرائيل هو عبارة عن سوق ولكن يجب أن يكون إيش السياسة المتبعة في السوق الفلسطيني هي مفصلة للسوق الفلسطيني فقط لا 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 That's all I have to say for today. Thank you very much. I'm I'm sure there's a lot I still have to learn about Palestine, but thank you very much for listening. Two two questions. Two two questions. الناسبين بيطلعوا برا يعني احنا ما بنستفيد منهم، كيف يعني من من نخلي الواحد انه يضل في بلده ويتاكد انه في مكان مناسب انه يوظف معنا فيه؟ She's talking about the brain drain. Yes. That's we are yeah, here in Palestine we are having a lot a lot, yes. a lot of intelligence yes. and a lot in of India people. also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how 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 we can keep them here and invest in this uh, It's a very good question. Very good question. Yeah. The people in Palestine, can we use them in the film but uh, are fine? One of them will have a mind and eyes uh, Second, have a money mm. and keep it uh, under the ground. How we can uh, solve the uh, problem uh, by change the social culture? Yes, the yes. Field? That's a very good question. Um, so these two questions are sort of related also. So, But let me, ask the, let me answer the question. The most important resource you have is people. The most uh, well-educated, well-developed people in the Arab world have always been Palestinians, right? So you have the technology, the human technology. The question is creating the incentives to bring them back, okay? India has the same problem. We all get educated and we leave. What does China do? China pays, your, pays for your education abroad and then makes signs a contract with you that says you have to come and work back here for five years or six years. Okay, so your education in America is free if you're Chinese. It's completely free. But you've signed a contract to come back and work. And when you come back, you're offered salaries and so on and so forth. So you have to create an incentive structure to fund and then return. This is very, very important. The problem is that the problem is that the Palestinians in the world is the problem of the people and the people who are educated and educated and educated and educated. ضرب مثل كيف انه في الصين في الصين اي انسان في الصين بده يتعلم برا في امريكا وما شابه ذلك بتعلم على حساب الحكومه بتوديه في اي في امريكا في بريطانيا في اي دوله ولكن ايش بتعمل معه اتفاقيه انه يجب ان 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 يرجع الى بلده ويخدم لمده خمس سنوات طبعا شو العلوم اللي تعلمها بده يخدمها في بلده طبعا بيعطوه رواتب بيعطوه كل حاجه يعني 
اللي هو لازم يكون عندنا نفس نفس السياسه انه ارسال اللي هو بعثات الى الخارج ومن ثم ايش؟ اللي هو استقطابهم من اجل العمل لمده معينه في بلده. To answer your question, which is a very important question as well, the most important institution of any country is the government. This is the most important institution. This institution has to be thrown open to people with talent and to people with means. Okay? How that happens, I don't know. I'm not from here. But you can never give up on the government. If you have a vision that, no, forget the government, I'll go and work for Padico, or forget the government, I'll go and work for Jawad because the government's too complicated, then the government quality will go down. Okay? No, no country can survive without... In India, when we were colonized by the British, the British bureaucracy was drawn from the most talented people in England. They had paid them the highest salaries to come to India to govern the empire. Okay? You don't, they, you don't, get, a gov you don't get a system without getting your best and brightest into the pr public sector. And unfortunately, we've come into a culture where we say our oh, politics is rubbish, government public is rubbish. It is rubbish. Currently, it's rubbish. But it can be something else in the future. And the only way you get to develop society is by focusing your resources, your cultural resources, your human resources, your talented resources on the public sector. And creating a conversation where you're like, you know, and you don't have to do it all at once. Do it ministry by ministry. Do it in Tulkara first. Get the Tulkara municipality working first. Then you can go broader and go bigger. You don't have to do the whole government all at once. You can break it down into small pieces, right? But that's what has to happen. أقول إنه طبعا أكبر مؤسسة هي اللي هي مؤسسة الحكومي إذا 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 في الحكومة ما اشتغلوش الناس الأذكياء والناس اللي إحنا بدنا إياهم معناته شو بصير في مستوى الحكومة بصير إيش بتنزل لتحت معناته الخدمات إذا كل الناس بدها تشتغل في جوال وكل الناس بدها تشتغل في باديكو معناته شو بتم عندنا في الحكومة وقول إيش إنه عملية التغيير عملية التغيير يجب أن أن أن, أن تبدأ إيش في البيت يعني بلش غير عندك في البيت في في بيتنا يعني اللي هو منطقة تول كريم وضرب مثال اللي هو ايش؟ اللي هو بلدية تول كريم عشان اياد الجلاد يسمع انه اول شيء خذ الكفاءات الموجودين والناس الكويسين عشان ايش؟ يصير في تغيير داخل داخل البلد وكل المؤسسات الوطن بالتدريج بنظر عملية تغيير. من كاس البلدية؟ حكى من سيبلتي. اكشولي وي ار هافينج اي ثينك 14 جوفرمنت سينس 1995 وي ار هافينج 14 جوفرمنت اب تو ذا لاست جوفرمنت. Due to my experience, I consider myself expert in this field. None of the governments has a vision of what they call about uh, industrial growth and industrialization. None of them. This is a, uh, the second thing. The private sector in Palestine also is not having a vision to work in the They are preferring to practice business in a field which they have two less maximum profit in services. Yes. And services, you know, it is not, uh, from employment point of view, you will not find that much of opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, the third thing, the, uh, the, 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 the educational system, under graduation, and the high, edu uh, 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 and, and the high education, uh, it is not, uh, what they call it, uh, built toward industrialization. Yes. Uh, I do have, 10 or 20, 15 uh, points about these yes. things. Corruption is there, I think. Yes, so, yes, yes. customers' loyalty toward national products is not yes. much. Customers, yes. they are not much liable. No. It took from me five yes. months to convince my customer to have a national ice, uh, an ice cream made in Palestine yes. instead of having ice cream made in Israel. It took, it took from me five months. How to convince those two, three, or three million people? to buy national product and the national product is highly what well, it's having a high quality and it's competent to the Israeli environment. Obviously in a situation where you are trying to learn your profitability is going to be very low. That's why poor countries stay poor because no one wants to go into higher value added uh, products because you can't compete there's no profit there. So I stay in simple products. I stay in olives. I stay in uh, I stay in local products, tourism. I don't go higher because there's no profit there. So therefore, that's why there's a market failure here. If you leave it to the market, the market only goes where there's profit. Yes. If there's no profit, I'm not going to touch it. I it, I don't blame them for not touching it. They don't want to lose their money. They have to survive. This is why you need subsidies. 
This is why you need someone to take the cost of losses for 10 years, 20 years. Because only after that, you will get, only after that you will get profit, after 20 years. Which company can last after 20 years? No company is last for 20 years. The government can last for 20 years. If all of us fund the government to last for 20 years. So it's a, it's a political arrangement, and then it's a, it's a understanding that, look, we're going to invest in this over long term, but we're going to do it in a disciplined fashion. If we just give away the money, and they'll put it in their pockets and go home, then we're bankrupt. This is India. Okay, so it's a risky project. But what's the alternative? The alternative is just to stay with olives. Right? That's 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 the alternative. So so it's worth the risk. بحكي بقول إنه كيف أنا بدي أصور ال ال الصناعة والاقتصاد الموجود عندي بناء أول حاجة اللي الدكتور مجيد شو قال قال إنه أول إشي اللي تغيير تغيير اللي هو ال 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 اللي هم الزبائن الموجودة عندي كيف الزبون أنا بدي أخلي لويال أو اللي هو يشتري المنتج المحلي ويترك المنتج المنتج الأجنبي طبعا الجواب اللي كان كان عليه قال إنه الحكومة هي الوحيدة التي تستطيع أن تتحمل الخسارة مش له سنة وسنتين لعشرين سنة لقدام ليه لأنه الشركات المنافسة لا تستطيع لا تستطيع الشركة المنافسة أن تقوم أن أن تقوم ليش لأنها شركة ربحية شركة ربحية لا لا تستطيع أن تتحمل الخسارة أكثر من مرة لهذا السبب مش مستعدة إنه ل ل تطور أي حاجة أو تقوم بأي صناعة لأنه عملية التعليم مكلفة حتى أصل إلى 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 صناعة منافسة الوال الحال الوحيد الذي يستطيع أن يتحمل الخسارة ليه الحكومة لسنوات كثير وبعملية إيش عملية الدعم تستطيع أن تصل إلى اللي هي سياسة اقتصادية وعملية اللي هي تطور وغير the last thing I'll say on this is that what's happening in Palestine Technical University is industrial policy already. Because the, you are all getting subsidized education. Right? The education that you're getting is below market price. You're not paying a market price for your education. Right? Someone is, someone is, there, there's a gap between what you pay and what your education is worth. But someone has made the choice. Society has made the choice that you know what? It's too important. Education is too important. We can't, uh, but if we if we charge market price for education, then no one will be educated, which is because you can't afford it, right? So this is a very concrete example of how the, there's a market failure in education, which is a key input into any developing society. So you've taken the step already. You're here. You've already taken the step on, on industrial policy, and so you can do it in other sectors as well. يقول مثال على ذلك اللي عملية حما الحما اللي هو جامعة فلسطين التقنية هي إيش إحنا نتق نتقادر اللي هو في أقل من كل الجامعات وهذا إيش عملية حما إنه الحكومة تتحمل الخسارة من أجل تطوير المجتمع واللي لأنه كل إذا كل شخص أو كل مؤسسة بدها تأخذ اللي هو الربح معناته ولا مؤسسة معناته كل الناس ما بقدروش يتعلموا اللي بيكون إيش المتعلم هو فقط طبقة من الأغنياء وبقية الناس اللي الأذكياء وما شابه ذلك ما ما بتعلموش وهذا أحد الأمثلة اللي هو على اللي هو دعم دعم اللي هو المنتج الموجود عندنا. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.